Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here with you today and, and talk a little bit about uh, how to choose the right PM role for you. Uh, this is a conversation that I have with a lot of new PMs, aspiring PMs, PMs early in their career, uh, and I'm excited to be able to, to share some of that knowledge uh, with you here today. So in terms of what we're going to cover today, uh, first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself so you have some context about who I am and where I'm coming from. Uh, then I want to zoom out and, and talk a little bit about what exactly the PM job is to, to kind of deconstruct some myths about it. Um, then I want to talk a little bit about some of the different factors that go into the PM job um, to help you sort of conceptualize what are the different areas that you should be thinking about when, when selecting a PM job. And then finally, uh, I want to leave you with some concrete questions that you can ask yourself when, when thinking about uh, the next PM job for you. Uh, so let's let's get right into it. So I'm Ani, Ani Mohan, uh, and I spend most of my time today as co-founder and general manager of GameSnacks. We're building a new gaming platform for first-time internet users uh, in countries like India and Indonesia and Nigeria and Mexico, where, where users are coming online to the internet uh, for the first time on primarily mobile devices, on flaky networks like 2G and 3G networks. Um, the business is being incubated out of Google's new business incubator uh, called Area 120. Uh, and prior to that, uh, I was a product manager on a couple different teams at Google. Uh, most recently, before, before GameSax, I was a product manager on the Google Chrome team where I was working in a very developer-facing role. Um, so we were building new APIs for the web platform. Uh, and prior to that, I was a PM on the Android team. Um, which is a much more hardware-centric role where we're building new Android devices for users in India and Indonesia. So I've had a few different experiences in my career uh, working on consumer products, developer products, and hardware products. Uh, I've worked on multiple different team sizes as well. Uh, and I've worked with uh, a bunch of different functions, engineering, design, legal, partnerships, operations, what have you. Uh, and I want to use some of those experiences to, to help highlight to you how the role varies uh, in a bunch of different contexts. So what I want to talk about next is a little bit about the PM role itself. So as you all know, uh, PM stands for product management. Uh, but I think the name product management is a bit of a misnomer for what the job actually is. Uh, <laughs> let's dive into that a little bit. So first of all, uh, when you're early in your PM career um, for the first you know, few years, you're not a manager. Uh, you are unlikely to really have people reporting to you, uh, most of the people that you work with, and even the folks who might be reporting to you over the course of your career end up being other PMs. Uh, whereas in reality, I mean, you're working with folks from across the entire org folks in engineering and design and, and partnerships and, and marketing and sales and so many different functions where folks don't actually report to you. And so that's one piece of it that I wanted to debunk is the, you're, you're not officially a manager in, in large part, especially in the early, early days of your career. And then secondarily, uh, you don't actually in practice spend as much time thinking about the core product uh, as you might think you might. Um, often when people first discover the PM role, uh, they think they spend a lot of their time sort of on whiteboards with engineers and designers coming up with sort of new product features and uh, envisioning what the next you know great product will look like. And while that's certainly part of the role, that's that's only a very small piece of it. Uh, and so I actually think both parts of of the job's name, product management, are both uh, are both a bit of a misnomer. Ultimately. What the PM job really is, is about influencing people to build the right things for the company. And I really want to highlight the people part of this job. The PM role at the end of the day is a highly people-centric job. Uh, and it's a job where uh, you need to constantly influence people who you might not have official authority over in order to ultimately build the right things for the company. And so with that in mind, uh, with that framing of kind of what the PM role is like, uh, what are some of the different ways that the day-to-day -day job could be impacted? I like to pose this question as kind of thinking about what are the key factors that actually matter when taking a new PM job? 
And there's three in particular that I want to talk about today. Here they are. The first, the life cycle of the product. So where in the project trajectory, where in the life cycle of all the different stages of a product that a product could be in is your team operating in. That has a very big impact on the types of activities and the types of jobs that you actually perform in the PM role. Second is the team size. Just very simply, how many total people are you working with? And then third are the functional stakeholders. Who are the types of people that you're actually interacting with and what parts of the company's uh, functions are, are they coming from? Uh, and we'll dive into each of these in a little bit more depth. So let's start with the product life cycle. Now, I think the way to think about this is there's many different stages that a product could be in uh, over, over its life cycle. In the very early days, it just starts with an idea. Uh, and so most of the work in those days is around actually getting support for that idea and getting funding for that idea within the company. Are the executives on board with it? Uh, uh, once they are, uh, are they actually willing to put headcount and dollars behind, behind that idea? Um, so that's the first stage, the funding stage. The second is once you actually have the idea funded, uh, you have support from the executives, you have headcount that's available, you have you know, dollars available for you to spend towards the, the product, actually building the team. Um, how do you get people to actually uh, get excited enough to wanna work on it? Then after that, it's about finding product market fit. So you have funding, you have the people in place, but uh, do you actually have a product that end users uh, want to use? I think this is the part of the PM job that a lot of people think about uh, that involves a lot of the core product work. But as you can see here, it's only one small piece of the overall, overall puzzle of where a product might be in its life cycle. Then after product market fit, a lot of the effort tends to be around growth. Uh, it might start with focusing on actually growing the user base or the customer base. And then finally, growing the actual revenue. So how do you convert all of that user growth and that great product that you've built into revenue for the business to ultimately um, drive the business forward because that's that's what your job is at the end of the day. So that's how I think about the different stages that a product might be in uh, and, and what I call sort of the, the product life cycle. And based on where your project is in this life cycle, the types of activities that you're doing might look very different. In the early days, when you're focused on actually getting your idea funded, a lot of your job is going to actually involve storytelling and pitching. Um, you know, when I started working on GameStacks three years ago, uh, I would spend 50%, uh, if not more, of, of my time putting together sort of a vision of what GameStacks could be. You know, why is building a new gaming platform actually compelling for Google? And spending time with people across the company um, from many different parts of it uh, to, to get support for it, to get excitement for it. Uh, and so a lot of that time is, is spent, like I said, storytelling and really thinking about what uh, what the product might be uh, and why it might be compelling to, uh, to different different parts of the company. Then, once the idea is actually funded and you're starting to build a team, a lot of your time is gonna be spent recruiting. And, and it's interesting because a lot of the recruiting activities actually share a lot in common with the pitching activities. It's still very much about getting people excited about what you're doing, about storytelling, about uh, painting a vision for, for what's possible if, if people work with you. But uh, the audience that you're focused on is very different. Um, in the early days, you're probably focused on bringing engineers and designers on board to, to want to work with you and your engineering counterpart um, to, uh, to choose to work on this project over, over all the different things they could be doing. Um, but uh, you know, if you're excited about trying to get other people on board to actually work with you, then this is a great stage of a project to, to want to join, to really focus on those recruiting activities. Then once you actually have the funding and the team in place and you're focused more on sort of the core product development work, um, the types of activities that you start doing uh, end up shifting again and tends to involve a lot of qualitative analysis. Um, in the early days of a product, when it's not very clear who the customer segment might be uh, and who exactly it's being built for, uh, a lot of the work might be spent and a lot of the time might be spent actually talking to users to brainstorming different versions of the product and building prototypes of them, um, you know, working with designers to build different types of mocks that envision uh, different ways that the product could live and actually putting those in front of people, um, getting their feedback, really listening to them. And so if you're someone who really cares a lot about spending time with end customers and, and hearing from them in customer interviews and user research sessions, this is a great part of the product lifecycle to be focusing on. 
And then finally, if you're more focused on the growth parts of the product, so if you're focused on growing users or growing revenue, a lot of the work tends to be more quantitative and analytical in nature. You know, you start thinking about scale, uh, and once you operate at a certain level of scale, uh, you can no longer rely on these types of qualitative signals to really tell you if you're going in the right direction. You're probably spending a lot of your time working with analysts, diving through data, maybe writing SQL queries, uh, maybe digging through Google Analytics or Mixpanel to see how users are actually using your product to develop quantitative arguments uh, and refine kind of your, your, your quantitative sense for why, why the product is working. So clearly you can see as you're in different stages of the product, the headspace that you're in and the types of activities that you're doing vary a lot. It sort of roughly evolves from more storytelling, which is what it looks like in the early days, to qualitative analysis, to then quantitative analysis. And different people are interested in different parts of this. And so uh, I would think a lot about sort of which types of activities resonate the most with you and how you can find a product in the appropriate stage of the product life cycle so that you can maximize the chance that you're doing that. So that's the first factor, the product life cycle. Now Lex, let's talk about the second one, the team size. The actual number of people that you're working with on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis very much changes, again, the types of activities that you're doing. And so there's a very simple way of conceptualizing this. This is literally what is the total number of people that you're working with. Um, it could be as few as two. Um, again, you know, when I started working on GameStacks, uh, it was just myself and my co-founder. You know, I came from a product background. My co-founder came from an engineering background. And it was just the two of us, uh, you know, in a room for three or four months. Um, and then as the team has grown, we're now seven people. Um, we're much closer to that five to 10 bucket. And the nature of the team has changed quite a bit. And the types of activities that I find myself doing has changed quite a bit as well. And then, of course, teams can be much bigger, especially in larger companies. You might be working with 10 people, 20 people, 50 people. Um, think back to my Android PM days when I would work with uh, teams of 50 or more people from all around the world across a bunch of different functions. It's funny, over the course of my career, I feel like I've progressively gone towards smaller teams, but it's not always the case. People can go in other directions. Uh, and, and the types of activities that you do, again, change quite a bit. And let's make this a little bit concrete. So what do I mean by that? Um, when teams are sort of in the smaller stage, uh, you know, two to five, again, you spend a lot of your time kind of doing storytelling, pitching style activities. Um, uh, because a big part of what you're trying to do is gain support within the organization for more people wanting to come and join you um, so that you can actually turn your, your vision into reality. Um, depending on what type of environment you're in, beyond pitching, you might spend your time doing a lot of actual building as well. Um, when it was just myself and my co-founder in the early days of GameStacks, uh, I was actually writing code. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, a formal engineer, kind of. I, I studied engineering in school. I haven't, I haven't worked professionally as an engineer, but I had to do whatever it took to, to get the product off the ground. And in that case, it actually ended up uh, involving writing code and making mocks and, and building the product. And so if you like actually getting your hands dirty and doing a lot of the IC work, if you like actually doing the end building, and you like sort of pitching, then operating at this stage uh, of the team size where it's relatively small, two to five people, can be a great place to focus on. Then as the team starts growing a little bit, let's say you are five to 10 people, in which case maybe your team of yourself as the product manager, maybe one or two designers, and maybe uh, you know seven or eight engineers, um, you have a lot of different things that you could be working on. Um, and a big part of your job as a PM is to actually think about, um, you know, how do you make sure that the team is working on the right product at the right time and, uh, and is uh, moving in the right direction? You can't rely as much on ad hoc communication. Uh, and so this is where a lot of the job ends up becoming, you know, writing product requirement stocks, PRDs, which is the canonical artifact of, of, of the PM job. Um, where you spend a lot of your time thinking about how the actual product works and how you can articulate it in, in a way that builds consensus and gets everyone on board across you know, the design and engineering functions to understand what the purpose of the product is. So if you like really thinking about what the core product does and how it works, um, then spending your time sort of focused on writing product requirements docs uh, would make a lot of sense. And this team size is a great sweet spot to focus on where you'd be doing a lot of that type of work. 
Then as the team starts scaling a little bit larger to let's say the 10 to 20 range, now you might be thinking about uh, multiple engineering teams, maybe two or three engineering teams, each of which has five or six people, maybe two or three different designers for each of those projects. A lot of your work then evolves from thinking specifically about the product to more project management style work. Uh, how do you make sure that all 20 people are on the same page and have a sense of what the most important parts of the project are uh, and are aware of things like status and are aware of things like dependencies across other teams. Communication then becomes a bottleneck um, to make sure that everyone is just aware of what's happening. So if you're someone who cares a lot uh, and gets a lot of energy from building process and structure uh, on your team and uh, making sure that uh, the ship is moving on time, that things are being executed on time, that this is a great, uh, great type of work for you to be doing is project management style work. And I'd say teams that are you know, roughly between 10 to 20 people really benefit from, from PMs who are very strong at this type of work. And that's something, something for you to consider. And then finally, when you start thinking about teams that are much larger, you know, 50 plus people, which is uh, something you'll really only find only in the largest of companies, um, then what matters a lot more is you being able to navigate cross team dynamics. So how do you think about what the purpose of your team is within the larger company and how might the incentives of what your team trying to accomplish, how might that uh, align or, or not align with other teams' incentives? Um, you need to be sort of very carefully attuned to why the different parts of the company exist, um, how it is that their projects are prioritized, and how you could think about how your projects might, uh, might ultimately fit into this larger puzzle. And so you'll notice a lot of this work might not actually involve thinking day to day uh, about how the core product actually works. Uh, it's a lot more about thinking about sort of the organizational complexity uh, of the broader environment that you fit in, even though your job title is still product manager at the end of the day. Uh, and so that's that's always the thing that I marvel at when I you know think about think about a graphic like this is the actual job title that you have, whether you're a two person team or a 50 person team, is product manager. But you can see here that the actual work and activities that you do vary considerably uh, at different different stages. Um, when I would spend my time on the Android team, um, I would spend a ton of time uh, navigating these types of cross team dynamics and thinking about how our team would work with the Chrome team, uh, how we would work with the Play team, how we would work with um, different functions, you know, marketing, operations. Uh, a lot of my time doing that. Um, and so it's, you know, it's a valuable skill uh, and something that can be very important to the organization, but, but is, is very different from core product work. So it's just important for you to, to keep that in mind. And then the third thing I wanted to talk about that can very much impact the PM role are the functional stakeholders that you work with. So who are the different categories of people um, within the company who um, you, you spend a lot of time uh, and a lot of effort with on a day-to-day on -day basis? Most PMs, when they think about the PM role, they're primarily thinking about these two functions, you know, engineering and design, uh, maybe the folks who are actually building the product, the engineering function, and the folks who are uh, envisioning what it looks like and feels like, the design function. Uh, and those are certainly two very key, key functions that, that PMs work with. But the reality is, I mean, within more organizations, it's a lot more complex than that. Even within engineering, there's obviously different um, different flavors of engineering, and at a rough first pass, so one way to think about it is front-end engineers versus back-end engineers. But there's also all sorts of other functions as well. Partnerships, sales, marketing, legal, operations, a bunch that I've left out here. Um, and uh, different PMs get energy and excitement from spending their time working with, uh, with different functions. And I think an important thing to consider, you know, what are the functions that you want to spend your time primarily working with? Um, one way that I think about that is roughly segmenting it into different industry sectors. Uh, obviously, this is quite simplistic, but I think it's illustrative to help you think about how different functions fit into different types of companies. And companies that belong to different types of sectors might primarily involve working with different types of functions. So, for example, if you're working at a media company or building a media business, like we're doing with Game Snacks, you know, we're building a gaming business, a lot of your time is probably going to be spent around uh, thinking about how consumers actually interact with the media, uh, which is a very design-oriented you know, way of thinking, but also partnerships. Uh, how are you actually going to get the content on your platform? We're, what is the relationship with the content provider is going to look like? And so a lot of your time, if you get excited about working with designers and partnerships folks, maybe you should consider working at a, at a media business or a media product. 
Contrast that with something like a crypto company. You know, if you uh, you know are trying to build a new crypto protocol or uh, or you know work at a crypto exchange, then you might be spending a lot of your time thinking about how the actual blockchain works, uh, and a lot of that work might involve working with backend engineers, but also spending time uh, working with uh, folks from the legal department to make sure that what you're doing is compliant in different states and countries that you might be launching your product in. Um, you can see here the types of functions that you work with are clearly quite different from where uh, where you might be working uh, if you work in a, in a media company, um, even though that might not be obvious when you initially think about sort of how a crypto uh, company's day-to-day -day work might differ as a PM from the media company's day-to-day -day work. Um, you know, there, I could keep going. You know, if you, if you go to a SaaS company um, where you're trying to sell software into a larger enterprise, you're probably going to be spending a lot of your time with the sales function. Um, they might be actually the most critical functional counterpart for you because they're the ones spending a ton of time with the core customers who you're going to be selling to. Uh, and so do you enjoy that? Do you get energy working with sales folks? Uh, and do you enjoy that the way that they think? If so, I mean, working at a SaaS company is a great, great choice for you. And then finally, maybe you get excited about sort of the operational parts of building a business, uh, making sure that things are moving on time, making sure that, uh, you know, you're able to construct a very high quality, heavily detailed long-term plan and are excited about executing towards that. If so, I mean, consider working at a hardware company where it lives and dies by these types of operational efficiency. A company like Apple is known for that. Um, a very different type of skill set and a very different type of functional expertise from, from a media company. Uh, and so I think it's very important for PMs to be aware when they're you know, taking new PM jobs of what functions it is that they want to be working with. And so that's, in a nutshell, I think three kind of uh, simple ways to, to think about how the PM role varies by different types of environments. You know, where in the product life cycle are you uh, when you're joining a new team? How large is that team? And uh, what are the types of functions that you're going to be interacting with and working with when you join that team? So what I've tried to do is distill a bunch of those into simple questions that you can ask yourself as you're exploring the next PM role for you and potentially in the final stages of an interview for, for a new PM role. The first um, is just how well funded is this product? You know, how much resourcing has the team that you're going to be working for and team that you're going to be working with willing to actually put behind that product? Because this will give you a hint as to where in the product life cycle you are. Is it the case that it's just an idea that's sitting around in a bunch of different sort of pitch decks? Um, is it the case that you know executives have sponsored it and are willing to you know allocate a certain amount of headcount towards the product over the next year? Um, is there also operational um, sort of dollars behind it? Uh, having a good sense of how well funded it is will give you a proxy for where in the product lifecycle the, the the product sits. Second, how many different people are you actually going to be meeting with on a week to week basis? Is it one other person? I mean, that's what it was for me with Game Snacks in the early days. Is it seven other people? Uh, that's what it tends to be now. You know, I meet with a ton of folks across the company, but most of my time is spent with the seven people on my team. Um, is it 50 different people? Um, you should be able to get a pulse of this even before you join. And you might be surprised by how dramatically your day to day changes based on the answer to this question. And then finally, just very concretely, who are the top three stakeholders for the success of your project? Is it the VP of sales and the VP of engineering? Is it the VP of partnerships and the VP of marketing? Um, is it the VP of product and the VP of legal? Um, you can try to get clarity on this even before you start the job and, and take the next role. And this will give you a rough sense of what functions you're going to be spending most of your time interacting with. So I hope this was helpful and gives you kind of an alternate way of, uh, of thinking about how to approach the PM job with the perspective that it's ultimately a people-centric job and that product and thinking about product is just one part of, uh, of the many different things you can be doing, doing in the job. Do you have any questions or, or feedback about what I said or even if you disagree about something that I said or disagree with the framing, uh, I would love to hear from you. Please reach out. My Twitter's right there, uh, Ani underscore C underscore Mohan. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn as well. Uh, but thank you for listening and watching and uh, looking forward to being in touch. Thank you.